I want you to turn to the person next to you. I want you to look them in the eye, and I want you to introduce yourself as a genius. Let's begin. How many people in this audience believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life, that your thoughts are intimately connected to your future. How many people think that? So your thoughts in some way create your reality. You believe that? So how many people in this audience have a clear vision of their future? You see, you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. Out of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts that you think in one day, 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you believe that your thoughts somehow are connected to your life, then the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices always lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the same emotions. And those very same emotions drive the very same thoughts. And your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your neurohormones, and even your genetic expression is equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. So then, if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, then you would have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You would have to become aware of your unconscious thoughts and observe them. You would have to pay attention to your automatic habits and behaviors and modify them. And you would have to look at the emotions you live by every single day that are connected to your past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. You see, most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of all the things you've learned and experienced to this moment. So if you wake up every morning and get out of bed on the same side, shut the alarm clock off with the same finger, shuffle into the bathroom and use the toilet like you always do, go and get a cup of coffee and drink coffee out of your favorite mug, then get in the shower and wash yourself off in the same routine way, drive to work, get to work, see the same people that push the same emotional buttons, do the same things that you've memorized and do so well, then hurry up and go home, and hurry up and check your emails, and hurry up and check your Facebook, and then watch your favorite television show, then hurry up and go to bed. Here's my question. Did your brain change at all that day? We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same unconscious actions, living by the same emotions, but secretly expecting your life to change. So there's a principle in neuroscience. And the principle says, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So if you're thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, reproducing the same experiences 
that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns and then produce the same emotions, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature. Because as you fire and wire the same circuits in the same way, those circuits begin to become more connected. And by the time you're 35 years old, this is science now, we become a set of memorized behaviors, unconscious habits, automatic emotional reactions, beliefs and perceptions, and even attitudes that function just like a computer program. And if you do something over and over and over again, the repetition of those actions over time conditions your body to know how to do it well, better than your mind. And a habit is when your body knows better than your mind, where you've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it better than the brain. And so 95% of most people's behaviors, attitudes, thoughts, beliefs, emotional reactions are subconscious programs. So why is that important? Because you're here this week to learn new information. And every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment and the footprints of consciousness is called learning, making new connections. And the Nobel Prize laureate Kandel in the year 2000 found that when people learned one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they couldn't repeat it, if they couldn't remember it, those circuits pruned apart in hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. And you are here this week to learn vital information about creating a future and be defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past. Because if you are not defined by some vision that is bigger than you and you are not passionate about that vision, then you're left with the old hardware of the past in your brain and you will be predictable in your life. So would you agree then? New thoughts, new information should lead to new choices. New choices should lead to new behaviors. And new behaviors should create new experiences. And new experiences should produce new emotions. And those new emotions should drive new thoughts. And that's called evolution. So if your brain is a record of the past, and you don't have a vision of the future, then you are living in the past. And you will never arrive at that new future. How many people understand what I'm talking about? So now, feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences. And you can remember experiences better because you can remember how they feel. And when you're in the midst of an experience, all of your senses plug you into the environment. And as you're gathering all of this vital data from your external world, all that information rushes back to your brain and it causes jungles of neurons to organize themselves into networks. The moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And once you feel that emotion, you create a long-term memory. Now reason this with me. If feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, 
and you are feeling the same way every single day, doesn't that mean nothing new is happening in your life? And if those feelings and emotions drive certain thoughts, and you can't think greater than how you feel, because you had events in your life that have branded you emotionally, and you feel sadness or guilt or shame or unworthiness or insecurity, all of those emotions are created from past experiences. And when you feel those emotions, and those emotions drive certain thoughts, and then those thoughts make certain chemicals for you to feel the same emotion, and then those emotions drive certain thoughts, the repetition of that cycle then conditions the body to memorize that emotional state better than the mind. And now your body literally is in the past. Because if you can't think greater than how you feel, then you are thinking in the past. And so most people then spend the majority of their life talking about why they never arrive at their vision of the future because of some past experience. And so if feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences, you remember your first kiss, you remember your wedding, you remember the birth of your children, you remember catching a fish off the coast of Manzanillo with your three best friends, because you caught the fish and it was a new experience and you felt great. And then you went to the casita and you cooked the mahi-mahi and you drank Sauvignon Blanc and the wind was blowing off the sea and the sun was setting and you made a long-term memory. But you also have memories that are connected to trauma and crisis, to disappointments. And those are the memories that people remember more than anything else. And so if you haven't overcome some emotion that keeps you anchored to the past, then you tell a story about the past. And people say, I am this way because of this experience that happened to me 15 years ago. I am this way because of some event that happened 30 years ago. And from a biological perspective, it means I haven't been able to change in the last 15 or 30 years. And Scientific American, a prestigious magazine, says that 50% of what you talk about in your past isn't even the truth. You make it up. Because you don't have the same brain that you did 15 years ago or 30 years ago. So then your brain and body are typically in the past because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So if you think insecure thoughts, in a matter of seconds, you are going to feel insecure. The moment you feel insecure, your brain is monitoring how you're feeling and you think more insecure thoughts, which then makes you feel more insecure. And the repetition of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind of insecurity. And then the person says, I am insecure. And whenever you say, I am anything, you are commanding your mind and body into a destiny. So then how do people change? They wait for crisis, trauma, disease, diagnosis, loss. Something has to go wrong in their life where they feel so uncomfortable that they finally make up their mind to change. And why is that? Because after the trauma or the crisis, they don't feel like of themselves. And the moment they don't feel like themselves, they could actually observe themselves. 
because they are looking at themselves through the eyes of someone else. But my message is, why wait? You can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. So then, if your brain is a record of the past, and you are living by the same emotions that have defined you for the last 10 years, and you keep thinking the same thoughts that make the same chemicals, and those same chemicals drive the same thoughts, then your body, as the unconscious mind, does not know the difference between an actual experience in your life that creates an emotion and an emotion that you're creating by thought alone. And so your body is believing it's in the same past experience 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. And your body is programmed into the past. And you can't create a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. How many people understand what I'm talking about? So then, when you react to someone or something in your life, you have a choice. That when an event changes how you feel, there's a chemical change that's taking place in your body. And most people don't think they can control their emotional reactions. And so then, when you react to some coworker or some relative or somebody in traffic, the moment you react emotionally, you are altered chemically. And if you don't know how to control your emotional reaction after that event, and you allow those emotions to linger for hours or days, you know what that's called? That's called a mood. Hey, Juanito, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm in a mood. Really? Why are you in a mood? Well, this thing happened to me four days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. And if you keep that same refractory period going on for weeks or months, that's called a temperament. Hey, why is she so angry? I don't know. Why are you so angry? Why are you so bitter? Why are you so enchilada? <laughs> because I had this experience seven months ago and I'm memorizing my emotional reaction. And if you keep that same refractory period going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And people wear their emotions on their sleeve, and that's who they think they are. And they will talk about the past to validate why they're not creating the life that they want. So then, if you wake up in the morning, Mexico City, and you are not being defined by a vision that's bigger than you, and it doesn't get you out of bed and inspire you into possibility, and you get up living from the old hardware of the past and the old emotions stored in your body, do you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to wake up and you're going to open your eyes and you're going to see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time. And the moment you open your eyes, all of a sudden now, it's your external environment that's controlling how you think and feel. Because you have a neurological network in your brain for every person you know, every place that you go, everything that you own, everything that you do. And the moment you open your eyes and you see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's your external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And you told me you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny. 
And as long as you're th thinking equal to your environment, you keep creating the same life. To change, to truly change, is to think greater than your environment, to think greater than the circumstances in your life, to think greater than the conditions in your world. And every great person in history knew this whether it was Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the Wright brothers, Joan of Arc. They all had a vision. Couldn't see it, couldn't smell it, couldn't taste it, couldn't feel it, but it was alive in their mind. It was so alive in their mind that they began to live as if that future reality was happening in the present moment. So here's my question. Can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, but you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain is literally changed to look like the event has already occurred? The latest research in neuroscience says you can change your brain from living in the past to living in the future. And can you fall in love with that vision to such a degree that you come out of your resting state and change guilt or suffering into inspiration and joy and gratitude? To such a degree that your body as the unconscious mind does not know the difference between that external event and what you're creating internally? so that your body believes it's living in that future in the present moment and you begin to signal new genes in new ways to change your body to look like the event has already occurred. The latest research in epigenetics says you can change your body by thought alone. Now reason this with me. If there's physical evidence in your brain and body to look like the event has already occurred. Your brain and body are no longer living in the past. They're living in the future. And you will walk right into your vision. Now, most people in this audience, all of you, have done something great in your life. You all have. A reason this. You woke up one day, or you had a wild thought out of nowhere. And that thought was a possibility in the future. Something new you wanted to experience. And the moment you started thinking about this experience, the moment you started contemplating this potential reality, you turned on a part of your brain called the frontal lobe the crowning achievement of the human being. It's 40% of your entire brain. It is the creative center. And it has connections to all other parts of the brain. And the moment you said, what would it be like to be a leader? What would it be like to be successful? What would it be like to have this vision come true? The moment you asked that open-ended question, you turned on this part of the brain because the rest of the brain is just a bunch of automatic programs. And now the frontal lobe, the creative center, wakes up and it has connections to the entire brain. It's the CEO, it's the boss, it's the symphony leader of the brain. And the moment you get creative, the frontal lobe begins to select different networks of neurons that are stored in your brain from things you've learned or experienced. And as you begin to think a what-if question, it begins to select these different networks and begins to seamlessly piece them together and making your brain fire in new sequences and in new patterns and new combinations. And whenever you make your brain work differently, you're changing your mind. Because mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. And the moment those neurons fire in tandem, you get a picture in your mind, a hologram, a vision, an abstraction. And for those people who are passionate, 
that thought that they're thinking begins to create an elevated emotion. They become inspired. They feel enthusiastic, in theos, filled with God. They become passionate. They started to open their hearts. And all of a sudden, they're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion. And it's the combination of a clear intention and an elevated emotion in our research over and over again that proves then the person now is changing fundamentally, changing biologically, changing internally. And their brain and body are moving from living in the past into living in the future. How many people are still with me? Yes? So then think about this. <clears throat> when you do that, when you had that moment, you came out of your resting state, and then you started to write down all the things you were going to do to get to that vision, all the choices you were going to make, all of the experiences or goals you wanted to achieve and all of the emotions and the joy you would feel. And when you were doing that, you were setting your sights towards that destiny. And then you did something really brilliant. You wrote down the choices you weren't going to make. You became aware of the behaviors you weren't going to demonstrate. You began to review certain experiences you wanted to stay away from. And then you looked at the emotions that would bring you to a lower level. And you began to separate the old self from the new self. And when you begin to do that, and you're observing the old self, it means you're no longer the program. Now you're the consciousness observing the program. And that's when you begin to objectify your subjective self. Now reason this. Let's say you've had some pretty rough experiences in your past. And those experiences caused you to feel sad and unworthy and guilty and judgmental. And you've gotten so used to feeling guilty and unworthy and judgmental that that just feels normal to you. And then because you feel kind of victimized, then you blame people and you complain and you make excuses and you feel sorry for yourself and that's your personality. And all of a sudden you say, today, I'm not going to do that any longer because that's the old self. And then you start off your day and it goes really well for about two hours. And then all of a sudden, the moment you realize that you're no longer making the same choices as the day before, you are going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. It's going to be uncertain. There's going to be some unpredictability. And we now know that people would rather hold on to their guilt and unworthiness than to step into the unknown because at least they can feel something. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment you are heading towards the new self. And we call it stepping into the river of change. But now, remember, 95% of who you are is your body as the mind. You know, you've done something enough times that your body does it better than your brain. So you may actually complain unconsciously because your body does it all the time. And all of a sudden you say, no complaining, no more blaming, no more feeling sorry for myself, no more talking about other people, I'm going to stop. You know what happens, don't you? The body starts sending signals to the brain. The body's been conditioned that way. And all of a sudden, you start hearing the thoughts in your head that say, why don't you start tomorrow? 
Tomorrow's a better day. This is too hard for me. I can't change. Something's wrong with me. It's my mother's fault. It's my ex-husband's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. I'm this way because of this event, or the most important one, this doesn't feel right. And the moment you respond to that thought as if it's true, that thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior that creates the same experience, that produces the same emotion, and the person says, this feels right. That feels familiar. Going from the old self to the new self, stepping into that void, stepping into that uncertainty, is the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal genetic death of the old self. And people will say to us, well, in that unknown, I can't predict my life or my future. And we always say the same thing to them. The best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. And when you and I get comfortable in the place of the unknown, that's where the magic happens. And it never happens in the known. So then, you are here this week as entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur, in the definition, if you read the definition of entrepreneur, there's one thing that's consistent in every definition, and that is individuals willing to take a risk. Stepping into the unknown, being defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past. So if you don't have your vision clear in your mind by the end of this week, all of this information is philosophy. It's theory. It's intellectual data that's stored in your thinking brain. But there'll be a certain percentage of people in this room that will apply this information, that will personalize it, that will demonstrate it. And those people who learn the information and store it in their brain and can repeat it, those people who start thinking about what they're going to do with it, as they begin to think about what they're going to do with it, they begin to install the neurological hardware in their brain, priming them to a new future. And when you take all of this information and you say, how am I going to apply it to my life? And you get your behaviors to match your intentions. You get your actions equal to your thoughts. You've listened to great leaders. You've gotten specific information about success. You understand what it is, what emotion, emotional intelligence is, and how it is to change a culture. And you start applying it to your life. If you're able to do it, you are going to have a new experience. And that new experience is going to enrich the circuits in your brain, because that's what experience does. And then you're going to feel like a leader you are going to feel successful. You are going to feel clear. And the moment you feel that feeling, now you are teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind has intellectually understood. We could say that knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body. And in that moment, you are embodying leadership. You are embodying success. You are embodying clarity. Why? Because the emotion is the experience in chemical form. And the moment you feel that emotion, you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. You are embodying knowledge. But now here's where the expert comes in. If you've done that experience once, you have to be able to repeat it. And great people in the world who are uncompromising, they keep working to reproduce the experience. And if you can reproduce that experience over and over again, neurologically and chemically, you will condition your body to become the mind of it. Now it'll be innate in you. It'll be second nature. It'll be easy. It'll be familiar. It'll be common. It'll be automatic. 
You've done it so many times that it is now who you are. So our jobs then, to go from philosopher to initiate to master, from mind to body to soul, from knowledge to experience to wisdom, and from thinking to doing to being. And you and I have all the biological and neurological machinery to do this. But some people will get all of this information and it'll be philosophical. They'll never apply it. Uh, those people who actually apply it and have the experience once will think that that's defining them. But people who really embody and make it innate in them, the true leaders of the world, it becomes who they are. They don't have to think about leadership. They are leadership. They don't have to think about success. They are success. It's become who they are. And so I want to show you some slides now to piece this all together so you begin to understand exactly what I'm talking about. I hope. Here we go. So our research, and we've worked with many companies in the United States and in Mexico and in Europe. We've worked with Sony Entertainment. We've worked with Cisco. We've worked with Coca-Cola. We've worked with Pepsi. We've worked with a lot of different companies around the world. And we know that if you give people information, it's my, wow, this is a weird clicker. Huh? I guess I should point this way, huh? Can we go back to the last slide? Let's just have you do it, huh? We know that if you give people, is there no laser on this? Maybe my battery's dead. I have the what? I have a pointer? Come up here and show me. There's a pointer here. Oh, this is where I have to point. Oh, I get it. If you give people sound information, and then they can repeat that information, they're wiring it in their brain. They're creating a new model of understanding. If you show them how to apply that information, if they do it properly, they will have some type of transformation. That transformation isn't something that causes people to feel bad or unworthy. It causes them to open their hearts. It causes them to feel joy, to feel gratitude. They feel differently. And if you're able to then create that elevated emotion and you teach people more information, they will continue to transform themselves, and that's called evolution. It's this, it's this one here. Is it there? Yeah, I think that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> oh, God. I'm pointing it at you. <laughs> oh, down there, way down there. Look, I'm pointing it down there. I'm hitting forward. Okay, now let's get it to work. So, if you think the same thoughts, the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the same feelings, and you're now caught in your old self. But 
new thoughts should lead to new choices, and new choices should lead to new behaviors. New behaviors should create new experiences, and new experiences should create new emotions, and that should inspire evolution. We say that your personality creates your personal reality. And your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. We could say that your personality is your state of being. So now, geniuses, if you keep thinking the same thoughts, keep demonstrating the same behaviors, keep living by the same feelings and emotions, your personal reality is going to stay exactly the same. But if you have new thoughts that lead to new choices, that demonstrate new actions, that create new experiences, that cause you to feel differently, you will begin to walk into a new future. How many people understand this? So most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality, and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So, crossing the river of change, going from the old self to the new self, requires you stepping into the unknown. And if you are now in the unknown and you feel uncomfortable because you're leaving guilt behind, you leave unworthiness behind. You see, the biggest problem with most people is they want to create wealth, but they feel lack. They want a new life, but they feel unworthy. That's mind and body in opposition. And our research shows that you can teach people how to recondition their body to a new mind. And when that occurs, they begin to create very powerful things in their life. <clears throat> so now, let's talk about the neuroscience of culture, because there is a neuroscience to it. You have a brain that looks just like the person sitting next to you. And if I was to screw off the top of your heads and take out the, your brain and your partner's brain, someone sitting next to you, and I went like this, and I set them out, you probably wouldn't be able to tell them apart because you share the same structure in your brain. And we call that universal traits, and we call it gross anatomy. Now, because you share the same brain as the person sitting next to you, you smile when you're happy, you frown when you're sad, you sleep at night, and, well, this is Mexico, you sleep kind of late at night and get up kind of late in the morning. Come on, I'm kidding. And, you know, you grab a stick the same way, we speak a language, and because we share the same gross anatomy of the brain, we have very universal traits that we have in common. How many people are with me? But now, how your brain is wired is your individuality. And that's the minute architecture or the minute structure of the brain. So then, <clears throat> your brain is wired different than the person next to you because you have different experiences. But if you share the same experiences because you're in a relationship, then you have similar brains that are kind of relating. And relationships are built on common experiences. If we share the same experiences, we share the same emotions. And if we share the same emotions, we can relate with each other. So then, think about it like this. You have a hand. And because you have a hand, you, you have the same hand as the person next to you. There's only a certain amount of things you can do with your hand. But now, what makes you unique is your fingerprint. That gives you your individuality. And that is really the minute anatomy of something related to a hand. Are you with me? So now, what is the division that unifies both the universal traits and our individual traits? And the answer is culture. Culture. And culture is defined by the environment in which you live, the environment in which you work, the environment of your family. An environment is made up of just a few things. Are you ready? People, objects, things, 
places, time, pets, and that's pretty much your environment. So then, the culture of Mexico City, <laughs> if I keep asking, I'll get it, huh? <laughs> no, no red button. Yeah, but put it on there. See? Nada. All right, try again. Try a green one. Hmm? Okay, we're doing good. So the culture of Mexico City is defined by the environment. You eat certain foods, you like certain music, you relate with one another because of the environment in which you live in. And that culture is created from the environment, which is different than the culture of Mongolia. Because it's a different environment, and they have different traditions, they have different customs, because they've had to survive in a different environment. And so what unifies individual, individual traits and universal traits is called culture. Now think about this. Most cultures are defined by the customs they have, the traditions, the language, their survival skills, their habits, their attitudes, their beliefs, their history, their arts, their social structures that have unified them as an individual culture. Are you still with me? So the people you work with, the people you relate with, the people you interact with, you share a similar culture that bonds you both as an individual and as a species called human beings. And Mexicans are different than Australians because they live in a different environment and they have different traditions. You still with me? But we could say then that culture typically is defined by things that have worked in the past. So then, <clears throat> most cultures then have a choice. To create a new culture means then you have to define your culture as a vision of the future. But most people, their cultures are based on the past present reality. What does that mean? We are in a changing world. And the world is changing faster than most people can keep up. And if you are going to stay defined by a memory of the past, you will not keep up with this culture because we are creating a global culture. So then, what defines the vision of the future to change a culture? And the answer is a very clear intention, a clear purpose combined with an elevated emotion. And when you combine a clear intention, like a vision of the future, along with an elevated emotion of inspiration and joy, you will create an empowered individual. But here's the problem. To the materialist who's waiting for their wealth to show up to feel abundant, they're in their past. The person who's waiting for the success to feel empowered is in their past. The person who's waiting for their healing to feel wholeness, they're in their past. The person who's waiting for their riches to come to feel gratitude, they're in their past. They're materialists. In other words, you have to feel empowered in order for your success to show up. You have to feel abundant for your wealth to find you. You have to be in gratitude for you to create the life that you want. And by you teaching your body emotionally what that future could feel like ahead of the actual experience is changing your biology. Because most people wait for something outside of them to change how they feel inside of them. And when something outside of them changes how they feel inside of them, they pay attention to whoever or whatever caused that, and they create a memory. That's the old model of reality of cause and effect, waiting for something outside of you to take your pain away inside of you. The new model of reality is about causing an effect. 
That means then you have to feel gratitude every day for your new experience to occur. You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You have to be empowered to create the success. And when you teach people how to do this, and they move into a new state of being, they begin to create the life that they want. How many people are still with me? But to the materialist, they would say, well, no, 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 I'm going to wait for my money to come and then I'm going to give thanks. And those people pretty much are living by the emotions of the past. And if you're living by the emotions of the past, you are viewing your future through the lens of the past and your vision will fade. Because when you bring up an elevated emotion, you will see the vision clearly. And leaders in history that changed the world knew how to change a culture. Look at Martin Luther King. He talked about justice and then got enough people inspired that they felt empowered enough to do something about it. People came out of the resting state. And so then you share the same brain as Martin Luther King and being defined by a vision of the future begins to change a culture. But most people have the same thoughts or the same intentions and they live by the same familiar emotions and for the most part they're in their past. So the future then is created by a clear intention and an elevated emotion, now listen closely, that you have to cultivate in your inner environment of thoughts and feelings. But most people by the old self are living from past memories that are created from knowledge and experience from something that happened outside of them some experience or trauma that defined them and getting a person beyond the old self then is the great work that's what we're here for so we've studied motivation and I can tell you without a doubt that the highest form of motivation in any culture, in any group of people, is what's called purpose motivation, duty motivation, or mission motivation. You know what that is? To have a vision to change a culture that's bigger than you, to instill change in the world. Look at Elon Musk. How many people know who he is? Elon Musk, he created Tesla Motors. You know him? You know who he is? He created an electric car that can go from zero to 60 in less than five seconds. And before him, electric cars were like golf carts that cr you know, crawled along the road. And he said, I'm going to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I have a vision. And I'm going to get the best engineers in the world and instead of creating a new product and selling it to a corporation, I'm going to get a group of people to share the same vision as me. I'm going to change the world by changing our reliance on oil. And I am going to make a difference in the world and I am going to make a lot of money. Why not? And so people said, no, that's not possible. And he held on to that vision. And now Motor Trend magazine never rated a car a, close to 100. They rated the Tesla car 103. It's the best car on the road. And it relies on no gas at all. That's a vision of the future. High motivators are some people who have a vision bigger than them that are going to change the world and make a difference in a culture. That's the highest form of motivation. Right underneath purpose motivation or duty motivation is what's called personal conviction motivation. We call these people self-starters. This is entrepreneurial motivation. This is when you say, I'm going to do this because I said I was going to do it. Still a high form of motivation, but not the highest form. But what we know, that people who have purpose motivation naturally are personally convicted. Their, their personal conviction is in alignment with their purpose because they have a reason to get up every day. 
The next form of motivation is called ethics motivation or morality-based motivation. This is not the highest form of motivation, and this is based on polarity, good and bad, right and wrong. And people then, you know, they're trying to be good, but they're really bad. And they swing back and forth. They preach one thing and they do something else. And a lot of the models that are based on, well, <laughs> a lot of models are based on this. But we know from our research that people who have purpose, motivation, have a vision that's bigger, them, bigger than them, that are personally convicted, have a great sense of morality, a great sense of ethics because it falls right in alignment. The next form of motivation is called ego-centered motivation. This is for acclaim and recognition and importance. But we know then that that's not a very high form of motivation and it never lasts. But people who have purpose motivation, have personal convictions, have a strong sense of ethics, naturally receive recognition. It's the end product. Now look at the lowest form of motivation. What does that say? Money motivation. People who are money motivated, you will spot them out in a crowd because they are selfish in their endeavors. They will take care of themselves first before they take care of others. It's the lowest form of motivation, but our research shows if you have a vision that's bigger than you, that's to change something, where you contribute to the whole, you have strong personal conviction, a strong sense of ethics, already receiving recognition and don't even need it, the money always comes. It's the natural flow. And we call that, in our work, affluence. You know what the word affluence means? To flow to you. People who are affluent don't go and get anything. People who are affluent have it come to them. That's who they are. It's a reflection of their state of being. How many people are with me? So then, when you have a purpose or a vision or a mission or an intent that's bigger than you, it means it signifies something that's ongoing. You could have a purpose to go east, and there's never an end to east. You could have a purpose to be healthy. There's always more health to have. You could have a purpose to be wealthy. There's a never an end to wealth. You could have a purpose for knowledge, and there's never an end to knowledge. It signifies a direction. My purpose? is to transform individuals in order to transform a culture. And I'm clear on that purpose, and it gets me up in the morning every single day. So then, how do you bring a vision from the world of possibility into the world of reality? From thought all the way down into matter, from what we say in quantum physics, from the wave of possibilities all the way down into the particle, from the immaterial, something that doesn't exist yet, into the material, from the world beyond the senses to the world of the senses. How do we do that? Well, it requires then setting up goals in alignment with your purpose. So let's just say you have a purpose to go in a certain direction, your purpose signifies a direction, but your goals should always be in alignment with your purpose. And people who have goals in alignment with their purpose, their goals are a natural side effect of them being on purpose. What do I mean by that? Let's just say you live in the United States, and you were living in Los Angeles, and your purpose was to go east. So you may set up the first goal to go from Los Angeles to Arizona. That's a short-term goal. And if you arrived at Flagstaff, Arizona, you would know that you were on purpose. Yes? And then you said, okay, my next goal is to make it to Santa Fe. I just should say New Mexico. <laughs> and when if you arrive there, then you may go to Amarillo, Texas, and then, of course, Little Rock, Arkansas, 
All of these are in a direct alignment with going east, and then finally to Atlanta, Georgia. And if you kept clear on your purpose, and you kept clear on your vision, then those goals would be a natural effect of you being on purpose. How many people are with me? So when you set up the goals in alignment with your vision or your purpose, and you arrive at your goal, that's how you know you're still on purpose. So then what about getting healthy? You may say, okay, I want to lower my heart rate. That's one of my goals. I want to lose, you know, 10 kilos. <clears throat> I want to have more energy. <clears throat> I want to wear a new wardrobe and have a new relationship. This is the short-term goal at the beginning, and the long-term goal is at the end. And as long as you keep making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, reproducing the same experiences, feeling the same way, you'll arrive at all of those goals. <clears throat> what about becoming abundant? You may say you want to be wealthy, and to me it doesn't matter. <clears throat> Wealth is a state of mind. You may want to start a new business. Once you start that new business, you may want to hire two new staff employees in six months. Then you may say you want to buy a company vehicle. And of course, then the next one is buy a new house. And then ultimately what? Make a million dollars? Why not? If that's your goal, to reflect your purpose, then you should arrive at it. Are you still with me? How about learning knowledge? Is there ever an end to knowledge? You may want to get an associate's degree. And then you may want to get a bachelor's degree. And then you may want to get a master's degree. You may want to get a doctorate degree. And then you may want to finally do research but all of those things are in alignment with your pur purpose, is it not? So what about this, exploring space? <laughs> Could you then, man, we placed the monkey on the, in a spaceship, that was our first goal, then we created satellites, and then we made it to the moon, and now we got technology to explore Mars, and then of course a distant planet, and ultimately enter the galaxy. So it looked like this. We send the monkey out into space, then we create a satellite, we go to the moon, we go to Mars, and as long as our goals are along the line of our vision, we'll always arrive at our destiny. Now, I want you to understand that there is a very specific formula for excellence. And the formula requires a person who has a clear purpose. But there are two other ingredients that put this together. The first thing is called competence. You know what competence is? Somebody who does something really well. The more competent they are, the better they are at doing something. The third thing is called accountability. Accountability means if you say you're going to do something, you do it. And if someone asks you to do something, you do it really well. And if you combine a person who's on purpose with a high level of competence and accountability, you have excellence in an individual. I run three companies, and all three companies, my teams, are very high on their purpose scale. They better align with my purpose. They have a very high level of competence, and they are very high on the accountability scale. And I don't even bother them. I never even manage them. Because if they're not competent, accountable, and on purpose, they're going to stand out with the rest of the culture, and other people are going to be doing their job, and they are not going to keep up. And I say to my staff, I run an Olympic-level team. You have to be able to play at an Olympic level. If you can't be competent and accountable on purpose, there's nothing personal. We just have to cut you because we're moving at a fast pace. So now, if you look at what it takes now to maintain a healthy culture so that a group of people can work well together, it requires the same three things. A person who has a clear purpose, let's say your purpose was to change the world and my purpose was to change the world. 
And if you and I shared the same purpose, we would be heading in the same direction. Would you agree? And if we're headed in the same direction, that movement in the same direction begins to create what's called trust. That invisible thing called trust. And if you're competent and accountable and moving in that direction, and I'm competent and accountable and moving in the same direction, you have trust in a community. And one of the biggest problems in the United States, companies that want to become Fortune 100 companies, this is their problem. Nobody trusts anybody because they're too competitive, they're angry, they have no emotional intelligence, they don't know how to work together in teams, and because of that, they have no trust in the community, and the community and the culture can't sustain itself. Are you with me still? So now, why do we lose sight of our purpose? Why do we lose sight of our vision? Why do we make the wrong choices? Why do we say we're going to do something and all of a sudden we do something else? And the number one reason is called stress. And when you see a predator in your life, like a lion or a cougar, you turn on a primitive nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system. And the moment you turn on that fight or flight nervous system, you are going to mobilize enormous amounts of energy to prepare yourself for some threat in your external environment. Now, Mexico, this is pretty adaptive. If you're being chased by a lion, you better have the energy. So when that happens, you're moved out of balance. Your pupils dilate, your salivary juices shut off, not a time to eat an enchilada. Your respiratory rate changes, your heart rate changes, and blood is sent to your extremities, and you're either going to run, fight, or hide. That's your three options. Run away, fight back, or freeze and hide. That's what people do. But what if it's not a lion? What if it's your mother-in-law? <laughs> and you've had some tough experiences with your mother-in-law. Do you know that you'll react to your mother-in-law just like she was a lion? Now, what was once highly adaptive is now very maladaptive. Because as you see the coworker, as you respond to the news, as you make a judgment, as you get angry, you are turning on the same system as if you were being chased by a predator. And you are moving your brain and body out of balance. And the definition of stress is when your body moves out of balance. And all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. The zebra gets chased by the lion, the zebra sees the lion, mobilizes all this energy, and now it escapes the lion. Fifteen minutes later, it goes back to grazing, and the event is over, and the body returns back to homeostasis. But human beings, we can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. Bills are adding up, rent is overdue, problems at work, and as you think about those problems, you turn on the stress response just by thought alone. And when you turn on the stress response and you can't turn it off, you are headed for some disease because no organism in nature can live in emergency mode for extended periods of time and expect to function healthily. So then reason this. The scientific facts are that 70% of the time people are living in stress. And when you live in stress, it's not a time to create. When you live in stress, it's not a time to be defined by a vision of the future. When you live in stress, it's not a time to go within or to learn. When you live in stress, all of your attention is on the outer world and not on the inner world because there's danger out there. And so people stop creating when they're living in stress and now they are viewing their life through a lens of the past and they lose sight of where they're going. So here's that definition where I talked about of creating different states of being. You react to an experience in your life if you allow the chemicals to run days, all of a sudden you say, I'm in a mood that lasts for weeks or months, I have a bad temperament, 
If it lasts for years on end, it's part of my personality. And all you need is one experience to do this, and you'll forget about your vision. <clears throat> so we live in two states of mind. Our animal nature is to live in survival and to live in stress. And the chemicals of stress are highly addictive. Fear, anger, hostility, violence, anxiety, insecurity, guilt, shame, sadness, unworthiness, depression, they are all created from the hormones of stress. When people live by this state, they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm the addiction to that emotion. They need it so they can get the rush of adrenaline. And this is why it's so hard to change. Because it is a scientific fact that the long-term effects of the hormones of stress push the genetic buttons and create disease. And I just said you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. That means your thoughts can make you sick. So if your thoughts could make you sick, is it possible that your thoughts could make you well? That's what our research is about. And if you know that the hormones of stress are highly addictive, and you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone, you can become addicted to your own thoughts. And this is why change is so hard, because people cling to those emotions because it makes them feel something. So living in survival is living in stress. It's being in what's called catabolism or tissue breakdown. There's disease, there's imbalance, there's degeneration, the emotions of fear and anger and sadness. People tend to be selfish when they live by the hormones of stress because when you're under stress, you've got to take care of yourself. So keep putting things bad on the news, keep creating fear, keep showing war, keep people feeling less than, and of course, they'll stay selfish and never create community. It's a great way to control people. When you're living in stress, you focus on three things. Everything in your environment, your body, and time. Because if you're being chased by a lion, you're going to put your attention on your body, you're going to become aware of where you're going to run in your environment, and you're going to think about how much time you have. And if you live by the body, the environment, and time, you are not being defined by a vision. Because a vision has nothing to do with your body, the environment, and time. It has to do with a thought. So then you're in emergency mode, you'll get very object focused, you'll focus on something over and over again. How many people have problems and you keep thinking about your problems over and over again, over and over again? That's how survival works in the brain. You keep focused on your problems. <clears throat> you feel separate from possibility, you define reality with your senses, you're living by cause and effect, you don't see any possibilities. Of course, you are really, your brain and heart are incoherent. We've measured this thousands of times. In other words, when you are impatient and you're frustrated and you're angry, your brain gets out of balance. And when your brain gets incoherent, you get incoherent. We measure people's hearts. We just came from a beautiful event in Cabo San Lucas in Los Cabos, 500 people training them how to train their brain and hearts. When you're impatient and frustrated, your heart gets incoherent. When you feel love and gratitude, your heart gets coherent. When you feel love and gratitude, your brain gets coherent. So then, <clears throat> people in emergency mode focus on knowns. They don't want the unknown. The unknown is dangerous. They want knowns and familiar. They lose their vision. The divine aspect of ourselves are the creative aspect of ourselves. That's when the body moves into homeostasis. We go from contraction to expansion. There's anabolism, there's body repairs itself, there's order, there's health, there's regeneration. The elevated emotions of love, and joy, <clears throat> of trust, of knowingness, of gratitude, they begin to produce 1,300 new chemicals that begin to heal the immune system. The hormones of stress produce 1,200 chemicals 
that lasts for 90 seconds to two minutes that alters how we think and feel. But isn't your definition of an addiction something you can't stop? So if I said, hey, I know you're really angry, but why don't you stop? If you can't stop your anger, then you're addicted. Valid or not, justified or not, if you can't stop your sadness, then you must be addicted to those chemicals. But those chemicals only last for 90 seconds to two minutes, which means, I tell my kids this all the time, well, they're older, but when they were younger, if you're angry for more than two minutes, you're faking it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> when you open your heart, you're selfless. When you're in that creative state, you're not defined by things, you're not defined by your body, you're not defined by time. We know this, we've studied it in the brain thousands of times. A creative person f forgets that they even have a body. They forget about the things and people in their life, they forget about time. They're in the creative state. And my definition of creation is when you forget about yourself. You go from selfish to selfless, and that's when you're at your best. We've proved it thousands of times. <clears throat> of course, energy is created. There's always growth and repair. People tend to go from a narrow focus to possibility, to an open focus. They feel connected to their vision. They feel connected to people. They feel connected to something greater. They're already defining reality beyond their senses. <clears throat> They're living no longer as a victim, which means most people think unconsciously that their personal reality is creating their personality. If your personal reality is creating your personality, then you're a victim. But if your personality is creating your personal reality, you're a creator. <clears throat> so now they're causing an effect. They're no longer living by cause and effect. They see possibilities. Brain and heart are in a state of coherence and balance. And of course, they crave the unknown. They want the experience. They want the adventure. They live for it. So I'll go through just two more, three more slides. So then if your purpose is to go east, and all of a sudden you head to Phoenix, Arizona, or M Missoula, Montana, or Miami, Florida, or Boston, Massachusetts, you've lost sight of your vision, and which means you had some thought that led to some choice, that led to some behavior, that created some experience, that produced some feeling or emotion, and you gave up on your vision. You went back to the old self. So you may say, God, I want to I wanna be healthy, but oh, you made the wrong cho choice. Three pieces of birthday cake, you miss a week of exercise, you stay up late and watch TV, you stop getting treated, and of course now, same thought leads to the same choice, which leads to the same behavior, which creates the same experience that produces the same feeling, and then you say, oh gosh. And then of course the feeling is usually unworthiness or guilt, and you return back to the same self. <clears throat> I want to show you one slide, okay? I want to show you what it looks like when you learn something new. You have a hundred billion neurons in your brain. A hundred billion neurons. The number of connections you have in one neuron is between 10,000 and 40,000 connections. If you took 100, 100 billion sheets of paper and you stacked them on top of each other, it would be 5,000 miles high. That's the distance from Los Angeles to London. If you took a scoop of gray matter the size of a grain of sand, you would have 100,000 neurons in it with over a billion connections. Now, I'll stop right after this slide. Learning is making new synaptic connections. Every time you learn something new, this is what's happening in your brain, geniuses. If you learned one bit of information today, your brain did this. Boom. That's learning. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment Every time you learn something in your brain, there's a physical change that takes place, and learning is making new connections. Are you with me? 
This is how fast it happens, too. That's learning. If you learn anything this week, you've made a footprint. If learning is making new synaptic connections, <clears throat> then if you keep firing the same thoughts over and over again, you're going to wire them in your brain. So then if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining them. And all of a sudden, they develop a long-term relationship. And just like any relationship, the more you communicate, the more they connect. And neurons are exactly the same way. Now, as you begin to learn information, neurons tend to assemble themselves into networks, or what's called neural networks. And neural networks are just gangs of neurons that have fired and wired together to form a community of neurosynaptic connections that's related to a thought, a skill, a habit, a behavior, a concept. <clears throat> and neural networks are automatic programs. You have a neural network to brush your teeth, to put on makeup, to speak a language, to walk. All of a sudden, those neurons then form a hardware circuitry but if you keep repeating it, the hardware becomes a software program and it becomes automatic. So then, you want to see a thought? Watch. Boom, there's a thought. Right there. Watch again. Boom. That's a thought. You generate more electrical impulses in your brain in one day than all the cell phones on the planet put together. And it's not coming from the candy bar you just ate you are connected to a greater field. So then, in closing, and I'll take some questions, you are here this week to begin to understand knowledge and information that is essential for you to begin to apply. Knowledge is power, but knowledge about yourself is self-empowerment. And we are in a time in the world where we need leaders. And true leadership has to do with a vision of the future. As the old models begin to break down in government, in the economy, in religion, in education, in the environment, in medicine, something new has to be created. And we should never shrink from these models collapsing. It's a sign that something greater has to happen. Innovation, creation, invention is our future. And that are you willing to every day revisit that vision and get clear on your purpose? and begin to take steps towards that destiny and give up the emotions of the past that keep you enslaved to the same person. Step into that unknown and literally believe in possibility. And Buckminster Fuller said it the best. He said, if you want to change a culture, forget about trying to fix what's broken create something that's better and everybody will leave that and go to something else and so people around the world are waking up because we are in an age of information and in an age of information ignorance is a choice learn study change apply and meet the challenges in your life with a greater level of mind. Surely somebody has faced the same things that you have and have overcome them. And if learning is making those connections, every time you learn, you are preparing your brain for the future. But be willing to be original. Be willing to be defined by that vision or that dream. And if every day you keep it alive, Sooner or later, that experience or that vision is going to find you. And that's when we go from being selfish to being selfless. And that's when we give people permission in our lives to follow us because we are no longer talking about it. We're living it. Thanks for listening. <clears throat>
Thank you. <clears throat> so they asked me to leave a certain amount of time for questions. So I will do a few minutes of questions. If anybody has any questions, you can give the mic to the people that are standing up. I, I'll let the mic runners pick the people. Okay, wherever you choose, wherever you choose. Give the mic to whoever you want. Hi. Anyone? Hi. Yes. Um, first of all, first of all, thank you for your speech. It was terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. And second uh, question. Uh, did you have any experience, any personal experience about, about this, about this speech? I mean, were you living in a in a past in a past life, and suddenly you realize that you were that you have to live in the in the future? Uh, it was it was tough to do that. Are you talking about a past life in this life, or a past no, life no, no. in another life? No, I mean I mean you you I, I mean uh, when you were shy, you. You are living in a in a past in a, in a past life, or, or I think you were angry. You were some kind of defects, and suddenly, and I and I can imagine, I can guess that before you do the picture, and you, what fuck do you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I understand. I understand. Uh, I never planned on doing any of this. Uh, in 1986, I was in a triathlon in Palm Springs, California, and I was on my bicycle, and I was making a turn to pass some cyclists. And as I made the turn to pass the cyclists, I got run over by a truck, and I broke six vertebrae in my spine, and I had bone fragments on my spinal cord, and the doctors four experts told me I would never walk again and I would be paralyzed. So in order for some people to wake up, they need a wake-up call. And that was my call. I decided against the surgery, a radical surgery, where they take out the entire back part of my spine and screw in these rods. I decided against the surgery in 1986, and I thought, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. Let's see if I can heal this with my mind. Now, nobody at this time <laughs> had any idea that it was even possible. As a matter of fact, the doctors thought I hit my head on the ground and that I had a head injury because nobody said no to them. But you know, when you're trying to create something like a miracle, you will always be considered a fool or insane because nobody else is doing what you're doing it's unconventional it's outside the beliefs of a culture but if you pull it off you'll be considered a saint a holy man a genius a mystic and so I was willing to lose everything for a thought or, a, or an experience and I went through a very dark night of the soul after my injury because I wanted to heal myself and I was impatient, I was angry, I was frustrated, I was unfocused, and I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do, which made me more angry. But every day, I had this thought in my head the power that made the body heals the body. I kept hearing it in my head. The power that made the body heals the body. And so I thought, maybe I can take my attention off of everybody and everything and go within. And let me connect to this power, this intelligence, and begin to give it a plan, a template, a design. And for six weeks, I would start doing it every morning. And then I'd think about living in a wheelchair. 
And then I'd start all over again, and then I'd think, should I sell my house? Should I sell my practice? And I realized I was focusing on what I didn't want to have happen instead of what I did want to have happen. And that's what the hormones of stress do. They cause us to pick the worst thing in our future and emotionally embrace it and be prepared for it. Because anything less, there's a better chance of survival. And so for six weeks, I went through hell. Because I would start reconstructing my spine and I would lose my attention. But I never gave up. Three hours every day, going within. And um, at the end of six weeks, I was able to go through my entire internal process without losing my focus. Because I reasoned that this intelligence, this consciousness, had awareness. And awareness is paying attention. So it was paying attention to my thoughts. So just like you know when someone's paying attention to you, they're present with you. And so I had to reconstruct my spine, but when I lost my attention, I would have to stop and start all over again because it wasn't a clear design. At the end of six weeks, I was able to go through the whole thing. And all of a sudden, my body started to change very quickly. My pain went away. My numbness changed. I started to get happy. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I started to notice that I was feeling better. And the moment I began to feel better, I was thinking about what I was doing. And now I did it with more passion and more conviction, more joy. In 10 weeks, I was back on my feet, and at 12 weeks, I was training again. And they came to put me in a body cast from my chin to my waist, and uh, I put the cast on for five minutes, and I tossed it. And I just made a deal with myself in those lonely nights where I couldn't sleep. I talked to this intelligence every day, and I said to it, I'll make you a deal. If I'm ever able to walk again, I will spend the rest of my life studying the mind-body connection and studying mind over matter. And since 1986, that's what I've been doing. I started studying people with spontaneous remissions and what it took for them to get healed. I went back to school and got another degree. Then I started teaching people how to do it. And then I got approached by a man that, that created What the Bleep. And he asked me to be in the movie. <clears throat> but there were two questions that people asked after What the Bleep. Number one, how do you do it? That's a good question, huh? The second question is, if your personality creates your personal reality, and I have to change my personality to create a new personal reality, why the hell is it so hard to change? I thought that was a great question. And so we started teaching workshops and teaching people how to change. And in the beginning, we didn't see much change. And now, 10 years later, we are measuring people doing the uncommon. We are measuring people doing the miraculous, of healing themselves of diseases, of creating better lives for themselves. I just came from Los Cabos, and the miraculous was happening at that event. Common people like you are doing the uncommon. And you don't have to be a Buddhist monk. You don't have to be a nun with 40 years of devotion. You don't have to be an academic. You don't have to be a scholar. It's time that common people are privileged enough to do the uncommon. And we've measured people and made scientific history in the last three years that you will never see in any neuroscience journal. And they were just people just like you. And now when people ask me, is change possible? I have no doubt in my mind. In my last book, I said, hey, how can you give somebody a sugar pill or a salt injection? And a certain percentage of those people will accept, believe, and surrender to the thought that they're getting the real substance. And without any analysis, 
they begin to program their autonomic nervous system to make their own pharmacy of chemicals that matches the exact same chemical they think they're taking. Is it the inert substance that's doing the healing? Or is it the body's innate ability to heal? So the question is, do you need something outside of you to change you? Or if you understand how the placebo works, can you teach people to do it? But instead of putting their belief in something outside of them, put their belief in something inside of them, or a possibility, an unknown, and have them revisit that unknown until they make it known. Because if 81% of people who have depression, if 81% of the people who are in a depression study are healed by a placebo, 81% are healed by a placebo, it means they're making their own pharmacy of antidepressants. And they don't need anything to do it. And so it's time people take their power back. It's time that we wake up. And my passion is about transformation, but not with elite individuals, with common people. And if you keep understanding that you need a flu shot because there's bugs with your name out there that are looking for you, and if you don't get the flu shot, you're going to get sick, that's the nocebo. Then when you, you don't get it, you'll get sick, and then you'll need a pharmaceutical. That's programming. But when people break out of that illusion and they begin to take their power back, they're no longer controllable. And now, you're talking about a race of individuals now that are believing in themselves more than anything else. And that's where we're going as a community in this world. <clears throat> Hi, so um, a quick question. On our way to achieve our purpose, I am assuming that to make each goal a complement, planning might be a good tool. And if I am correct, do you have any advice on how to go about it? Sure. So the question was about planning. <clears throat> Do you know that if you woke up in the morning and instead of getting out of bed, what do most people do when they wake up in the morning now? What do you do? Admit it. You go to your cell phone and you go, oh, oh my gosh, Monica's eating carbohydrates again. Oh, look, my boyfriend from high school Facebooked me. Ooh. Oh, look, there's a war in Syria. Everybody goes to their device to plug them in. But what if you woke up in the morning and you said this, what is the greatest expression of myself that I can present to the world today? What if you said, I'm going to be defined by this vision. Let me be become conscious of those unconscious thoughts. Let's become so, let's become so conscious of those unconscious thoughts that they'll never slip by my awareness. You know, I can't, it's too hard, nobody loves me, I'm bad. So, old circuits from the past. What if you said, no more complaining, no more feeling sorry for myself, no more judging anybody, I'm going to stop that. What if you said, I'm not going to be guilty anymore, I'm done. I'm not going to be unworthy. Those are the emotions, behaviors, and thoughts that are connected to the old self. The word meditation literally means to become familiar with. That's what it means. If you're becoming familiar with your unconscious thoughts and making them conscious, you're meditating. To know thyself. If you become aware of your automatic habits and you're so conscious of your unconscious behaviors that you never go unconscious again, you're changing. If you're familiar with your emotions and say, that's my past, those are chemicals from the past, let's leave them behind. And then you said, who do I want to be when I open my eyes? What thoughts do I want to think? 
What thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain? Let me plan my behaviors today. Do you know the very action of planning your behaviors in your mind, rehearsing what you're going to do? Do you know that mental rehearsal actually installs the circuits in your brain to look like the experience has already occurred? Now your brain is no longer living in the past. It's primed for the future. And if nerve cells that fire together wire together, you keep doing that, it's going to become familiar to you. And so then, here's the tough part. Not for Mexicans, though. If you said, I am not going to get up from this meditation until I am in love with life. I'm going to leave my sadness and pain behind and I'm going to open my heart and I'm going to feel gratitude. I'm going to feel joy. I'm going to feel inspiration. Do you know that the moment you start creating those chemicals, you are signaling new genes ahead of the experience? And now, if you can combine in a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you are literally biologically changed. And if you can get up from your meditation feeling like somebody else, your job is to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day. Because if you keep cultivating that elevated emotion, it's going to become familiar to you. And if you're able to maintain that modified state of mind and body every single day, get ready because something unusual is going to happen in your life. It's the law. You are going to run into a new opportunity because you're in a new state of being. And that's what we teach people, to rehearse the future and to take the brain out of the past and put it in the future. Take the body out of the past and put it in the future. But if you get up every single day feeling the same way and you wake up and you go, oh my God, who's that? Oh, God. Wait, let me remember my problems. Ugh. You just return back to the old self. So the act of planning your behaviors, the research shows that as you begin to plan what you're going to do and how you're going to do it, you begin to change your brain to look like the event has already occurred. And you begin to prime your brain into the future and out of the past. And if you can create the emotion, you are more prone to get your behaviors to match your intentions, your actions equal to your thoughts, and your mind and body working together. And you will begin to arrive at a new destiny. We've seen it over and over and over again. <clears throat> Last question. One more. What time? Hey. Last question, OK? Buenas noches. ¿Dónde estás? Oh, hi. Okay. Es un honor el que yo pueda estar aquí. Yo vi su video hace unos meses de ¿Y tú qué sabes? Sí. Y Ready. creo que me estoy generando esto, el, el conocerlo. Eh, yo quiero saber cómo puedo hacer un paso cuántico, cómo puedo hacer mi paso cuántico. How to make the quantum leap. And you want me to answer that in two minutes or three? <laughs> Look. No. What is the simple definition of quantum? Quantum physics says that your mind and matter are so in intimately connected that it's impossible to separate the two. That matter has a mind and mind is in matter and you can't pull them apart. And so, Newtonian physics, the world we live in, is the physics of the predictable. Okay, we're going to shoot a rocket to the moon. We need to know the distance, we need to know the speed, and because we can figure out all of those elements, we could say that Newtonian physics, we can predict where we're going. And we can predict how much time it takes. But the quantum model of reality is about the unpredictable. It's about this place of uncertainty. 
And so in quantum physics, it's amazing because when they started studying the very, very tiny particles in atoms, like electrons and photons, they expected that those particles would behave like planets rotating around the sun, predictably, but they don't. They respond to mind. And so now, all of a sudden, the quantum physicist comes along to measure the electron. And the electron goes from a wave of possibility, and all that energy collapses into a particle, and it's called collapsing the wave function. They turn their back and no longer look and observe the electron, and it turns back into energy. So mind is affecting matter. So, I have drank martinis with quantum physicists till sunrise, hundreds of times. And they always say, well, the observer effect works really well for the tiny, small subatomic particles, but not for the very large. And I always say the same thing to them. Yeah, the observer does work for the very tiny and not for the very large, but what if we're poor observers? What if we can get better at observation? In other words, if you wake up every morning and you do the same thing all every, that you've been doing for the last 10 years, then you're caught in the predictable world of Newtonian physics. And if you're doing the same thing over and over again, we can take your past and lift it up and set it on your future and it's going to be exactly the same. So then if you're viewing your life from the same level of mind every single day, then you are collapsing the same possibilities into the same reality. So if you teach people then to find the present moment, in quantum physics all possibilities exist in the present moment. But most people's brains are anticipating the future based on the past and they're not present. So then it requires training. It requires people retreating from their lives and practicing finding the present moment and beginning to change their habits and their thoughts and their behaviors. However, when you live by the hormones of stress, most people don't know this, but there's an invisible field of energy around your body. And when you react to someone or something, you draw from this invisible field and you turn it into chemistry. And the field around your body shrinks. How do I know? I measured it. And now you're more matter and less energy. You're more particle and less wave. And most people then, when you are matter trying to change matter, you always try to force the outcome. You try to control the outcome. You try to predict the outcome. And people then get competitive or they hold on or they manipulate or they cheat or they steal because that's the only way they can get what they want. But the quantum model of reality, when you are truly in the present moment, and we've measured this in brain scan after brain scan, you forget that you're a woman. You forget your name. You forget your age, you forget your culture, you forget your past, you forget your future, if you forget that you have a body, you forget that you have parents. When you're truly in the present moment, you go from putting your attention on your body, your environment and time, to becoming nobody. No one, no thing, nowhere, in no time. You become a thought, alone, in possibility. And if you are going to heal your body by thought alone or change something in your life by thought alone, then you have to become thought alone. And teaching people how to linger in this place of the unknown is what begins to change their energy. We also measured when a person begins to open their heart and they can begin to sustain an elevated emotion they begin to broaden the magnetic field around their body to nine meters wide. Now they're more energy than matter. They're more wave than particle. And they can exert better effects 
on reality. So then think of when you open your heart, this is science, like dropping a pebble in water. You produce a ripple. If you drop a bigger stone, you produce a bigger ripple. If you're able to sustain that state, you keep dropping the same rock over and over again, and you broadcast a signature into the field. The emotion is the magnetic charge. Your intention, your thought, is the information that's carried on that wave. And when you combine a clear intention with an elevated emotion, you begin to produce an effect on matter. They did an experiment. They took a group of people that were expert prayers and healers. And they took three vials of DNA and they set them in front of them. And they said to these people, we want you with your mind, with your intention, to see this DNA wind or unwind. And keep doing it over and over again with your mind. Close their eyes, just visualizing it, winding and unwinding, winding and unwinding. At the end of the experiment, they checked the DNA. Guess what happened? Nada. <laughs> Nunca. Nothing. Nunca. Nothing changed. So then they said to these people, okay, now open your heart and feel gratitude, loving kindness, create a feeling of goodwill, and just generate this feeling into the field. And we want to see if it changes the DNA. Over and over again, they kept creating this loving feeling. Check the DNA. Niente. Nothing. The elevated emotion did nothing to change the DNA. It had no effect on matter. But when they said to those people, we want you to see the DNA unwinding in your mind. That's intention. Intention is getting clear on what you want. And we want you to give thanks ahead of the actual experience, as if the DNA unwound. 25% of the DNA unwound at a remote location. You see, the thoughts that you think are the electrical charge in the quantum field. The feelings that you emote are the magnetic charge in the quantum field. And how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life. The thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the event back. So if you're walking around your life feeling sorry for yourself and feeling like a victim, you are broadcasting that signature into the field. And you will create more experiences to suffer because we are not punished for our sins. We are punished by our sins. And sin is an attitude. And sin is how you think and how you feel. So then when you cause people to give up their guilt and their shame and their unworthiness and teach them how to open their heart and create coherent waves in their brain and in their heart, they are going to produce the miraculous. So to answer your question, it takes training, and it takes practice, and it takes learning new information and deprogramming ourselves into believing that we're limited. And I just came from Los Cabos with 500 people, and the miraculous was happening all around. Why? Because just like people believe that an infection can produce a disease amongst the community, I believe that wellness is as infectious as disease. And you get a group of people together that truly want to do this, we measure the energy of the room in every one of our events. And you know what? In Los Cabos, we made history. We had never gotten measurements like that ever. Because people, when they open their heart, they're adding to the field. They're producing an energy that people can be begin to interact with. But if you're living by the hormones of stress and you have no energy, no field, then you can't produce an effect on matter. So then, life is about the management of energy. And where you place your attention is where you place your energy. And if your attention is on the knowns and in the predictable future, 
or your attention is on the familiar emotions of the past, you are siphoning energy out of the present moment and you have no energy to create with. Getting people beyond their identity, getting people beyond their past, getting people beyond predicting their future, getting people beyond their faces or their wardrobes or their sports cars or their importance, getting beyond all those things is when they begin to make contact with the quantum field. You can't enter the quantum field as a somebody. You have to enter as a nobody. And when you're able to do this and practice it really well, you will begin to do what's innately your birthright, and that is to create an unknown or wonderful experience in your life. So it just takes practice in order to do it. And I'm happy to say that in the last event we just had, just, I just came from Los Cabos, amazing miracles and amazing stories and great people that were doing the amazing. So common people are doing the uncommon. Thanks for listening.